All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on a very stormy Johannesburg evening. Uh, it's good to get some rain in the high felt. Uh, and I'm delighted to be joined this evening by Connie Mulder from Solidarity, who's going to be speaking to us about South Africa's ongoing energy crisis. The title of tonight's talk is called Ensuring that the Light at the End of the Tunnel is On. And uh, hopefully that light is uh, some electricity <laughs> and not an oncoming train uh, that is heading towards us. Um, but in all seriousness, I think South Africa's energy crisis is really a choke point for the South African economy. And I think what we're witnessing is really the decline of the old system of energy generation in South Africa. And that transition is very uncertain, very disruptive. But also think there's some interesting and exciting developments, particularly us as free marketeers. We're interested to see potentially an increased role of the private sector in energy generation in South Africa. What that looks like is still a little bit unclear. I think part of what we see as our role as the Free Market Foundation is providing a roadmap and encouraging policymakers to move in that direction. But the state and politicians are still very eager to stage manage the process and control everything. So those are some just some thoughts for us to consider as we listen to Connie's talk. Uh, just a little bit about Connie Mulder. Uh, he's the head of research at the Solidarity Research Institute, and he is also the national spokesperson for Solidarity. Solidarity, as you know, is a, a trade union. And uh, before joining Solidarity in 2017, uh, Connie actually worked as a SAP consultant uh, with a number of, of major blue chip clients and uh, listed firms. He holds a BA in Communication Studies as well as a BSc in Computer Science from Northwest University. Uh, and in addition to that, he has a degree in Politics, Philosophy and Economics from Academia. Uh, so without further ado, I hand over to you, Connie Mulder. Thank you so much. And before we do so, just a reminder, we will be having a Q&A session at the end of Connie's talk. So please just save your, your questions uh, for when he's done with his presentation. Thanks very much. Oh, thank you, David, for the, the good introduction. Uh, usually when I get introduced, it's not that uh, flattering, uh, <laughs> especially if it's on TV these days. Uh, they, they tend to mention us as that small right-wing trade union, <laughs> in which case we answer that, who are you calling a small trade union? But <laughs> no, so um, I think this is, a, this is a crisis that each one of us feels uh, very acutely. Uh, we've experienced that with our members. Is um, Corruption is something that is far away, but when the power goes out in your house and you can't make dinner for your children, uh, suddenly it hits home very hard. And that's why we've uh, started focusing on ESCOM since I think 2019. We really started uh, going in depth. We, uh, we first had a case study in can you put a parastatal under business rescue with SAA, which had a, a specific goal of managing that and getting it... Um, getting ESCOM as the next one. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the legal president hasn't worked out exactly like we want, but now we're in the business of, on the one hand, uh, applying pressure um, to the policymakers as well as to ESCOM itself. With We've got more than 6,000 members in ESCOM, so we, we've got a very good feel of what is going on on the ground level. And this, on the other hand, um, we're moving in, into just creating realities regarding uh, electricity and power generation in the areas that where we are, saying that if you're going to wait for uh, permission, we're going to sit in the dark for a long time. So if we um, if we go forward, let's let's say how how did we get here? So the first slide, and this is the one that that basically uh, contains everything. Is this is the amount of gigawatt hours that ESCOM has actually sent out over the last decade, um, roughly. So we've went from 250,000 gigawatt hours in 2012 to 226,000 gigawatt hours uh, 10 years later. So this is an economy that's 10 years bigger, uh, a population that's 10 years bigger, yet we're sending out more than 10% less power than we should have. And that is why we have load shedding, for the simple reason we're not generating enough power. Now this on its own could mean maybe we've just become frugal with uh, electricity usage. However, when we take the CSIR's projections, it says what amount of gigawatt hours should we be using in a, in a year, then we can see that we're drastically failing uh, as a country to get close to the energy demands that we need. Um, we should, on the junk status, ex expected junk status projection, we should be sending out 256,000 gigawatt hours um, every year. We're doing 226,000. Uh, last year, 
it hovered at about 200,000. This year, we're going to most likely be below that, um, just due to the massive amount of load shedding that we've experienced thus far. Now, this says South Africa is, is simply not, not succeeding in this. Now, for any economy, energy stability is, is the cornerstone. Without it, you cannot continue. And we've seen that, that in 2007, 2008, load shedding started, and our GDP per capita in US dollar terms has completely flatlined uh, since then, which means, in, sh in short, every single South African has gotten poorer um, every single day. Uh, we've, we've gotten more debt with less money. Uh, that 2012, 2020 dip is obviously, that's the COVID dip that, that hit us, but COVID hit us whilst we were already on our knees uh, due to several other mismanagement situations. So that says this crisis is, is truly severe. Now, we can see that... Um, with, with our members for the simple reason we've got more liquidations, we've got more retrenchments that we need to manage suddenly. Uh, we get uh, several, uh, it's, it's actually heartbreaking. We've now got an email address, ESCOM at Solidarity, and then you've got people desperately asking you, can we somehow give them power, their business is going to go under. Um, and now we're, we're not capable of doing that for everyone, but the impact on the normal average of African has been, has been devastating. For interest sake, it's the one issue that actually has an electoral impact on the ANC as well. Um, people tend to sort of forget the average ANC voter does not care that much about tax money being mismanaged because they, they're a receiver of tax money. They're not one that pays tax money. We've got 3 million people who pay 95% you know, of all the taxes in South Africa, and they don't vote for the ANC in large degrees. Uh, then at the same, in the same instance, electricity tariff increases doesn't bother you that much when you're simply not paying electricity or you're getting it illegally, which is a large portion of the ANC's voter base as well. If you just look at Soweto's debt situation, which is spiraling out of control with no one able to actually control it. But when the power goes off in your house, suddenly all of this mismanagement that you've read about in the papers comes home and hits hard. And then when the power goes off for eight to ten hours a day, which is, we've been through that and we're going back into that again, um, then people start really getting angry. The last one, in, this, is the, this is the one that is, uh, for us as a trade union, but particularly regarding, is um, what has happened to unemployment in South Africa. Now, stat Statistics South Africa, um, as head of research, we do a lot of statistics and you can do a lot with statistics. So you can see when someone else is trying to manipulate it. And that is what St Stat South Africa is trying to do uh, par excellence with the unemployment numbers. So now you've got the uh, narrow definition and the broad definition of unemployment. And according to all research articles that we've read, South Africa should be using the broad definition. Uh, the moment you've got a discrepancy of almost more than 6%, uh, between the two and you've got long-term unemployment, then you should not be looking at the narrow definition anymore. So what we do every single time Statistics South Africa gives out the unemployment numbers, we go and calculate the actual unemployment, which is unemployed people as long, along with discouraged work seekers and then long-term unemployment. And that puts South Africa closer to 43% unemployment, if you if you take that into account. What, what should particularly worry us is that if you're a discouraged work seeker, the average, I think two thirds of discouraged work seekers and um, long term unemployment people have not found a job in more than 12 months. So that means for 12 months they've been actively looking and they, and they can't find a job. So we've got a, an economy that is simply not fulfilling the needs of uh, the country that it should. We've got massive unemployment and you've got a government whose sole answer to this is to try and spend more. On, on, uh, on grants and get grant us out of this. And uh, along with this, you're hitting this economy with an energy uh, crisis that truly no one else in the world quite <laughs> has experienced to this level. Um, we've obviously looked at international examples and everyone had an energy crisis at some point, but no one has been in one for 16 years without any uh, proper solution as South Africa has uh, proudly done. So then the question is where where are we going? We've, we've been in this energy crisis for 16 years, um, so hopefully somebody somewhere has woken up and said that we're, it's going to get better uh, at, at some point. Now this is unfortunately uh, not good news. This is ESCOM's energy avail availability factor, so it's quite simple. A uh, coal-fired plant has a certain amount of time that it actually runs, a certain amount of units, and every now and then a unit trips or it goes off for maintenance. The international standard is you should try to aim for 70 to 75 percent availability factor for a, uh, a power plant. Because Africa had quite good um, energy availability factor in the 19, uh, 20, 
2012. We managed, I think, 80%. We were exceptional in the early 2000s. ESCOM won prizes for how well they ran their coal fleet. But this has rapidly declined. Now, this, this is out of ESCOM's own operational statistics. Um, it has rapidly declined to 62% last year. This year, we're below 50% for most of the year, which means we've got 40,000 megawatt installed coal-fired uh, generation, but at any given time, only about 20,000 megawatt of that is actually generating power. The rest is uh, unplanned maintenance. So they've got 3,000 megawatt on planned maintenance, and then we're now sitting at 16,000 unplanned maintenance, which means a unit tripped, either it got sabotaged or something happened, and it's not, it's not online anymore. Now, this is quite simply an impossible situation to manage if you're ESCOM. The only way out of this is you need to build more power plants, but the two newest power plants are the worst offenders in energy availability factor. Um, Madupi and Kusile are truly badly designed. Uh, we've now lost three units at, um, at I think it's Madupi, where the chimney stack wasn't designed correctly and they had to put on uh, decarbonizing chutes and this created a residue that got too heavy and then the chimney stack collapsed, which means South Africa has lost two and a half thousand megawatts of generating capacity just from bad design. And now we've, we've taken Kuberg offline as well for one of the reactors for another thousand megawatt. So that's why we're in this dire situation of load shedding now. We've got three and a half thousand megawatt on planned maintenance, which should be on planned maintenance. But then uh, then the, the fun starts. Um, if you, We've now... Uh, We've been in this space for a while, and several of these power plants have suddenly developed a profile that you would never associate with a coal plant. Um, it's the weirdest situation. Uh, things that just catch fire that shouldn't catch fire. Our members have reported several instances at Tutuka specifically. Um, at Tutuka, the power plant manager, for interest sake, has to walk around with a bulletproof vest, so it's, it's become rough there. But uh, you would have a situation where the power plant, the unit trips, and then when they find the fault, it's one cable that has been cut, but it's in the middle of a whole bunch of cables, like 10, 12. And that means it's somebody who has access, who has knowledge, who knows exactly which cable to cut to uh, trip that unit. And this is happening with a scary frequency, um, where the moment the country goes into a bit of pressure, you're going to stage two or stage three load shedding, uh, suddenly three or four units would trip at other power stations without any reason. Uh, being a gearbox would seize because the oil has been drained. Um, uh, they just simply hit a little uh, looking glass with a hammer and then the oil drains out of the gearbox and it seizes eight hours later when you're not on shift anymore. Or uh, the newest thing that would happen is they would, um, you've got a, a little drip on the black start, on the, uh, the black start oil for the power generator. And then you would put a, a little uh, lid that fills up in about four to five hours. And when that trips, uh, it spills oil onto the electrical wire that is ex exposed and that means the whole thing catches fire but it happens five hours later so suddenly the country would go into pressure on the afternoon and then they would ensure that during the evening peak three or four units more due to sabotage get get tripped suddenly and, um, and then we're going into stage six and that creates a lot of repercussions then um, obviously so this energy availability factor is not simply due to old power plants it's due to bad design of Madupi and Kusile and it's due to, to sabotage in several instances, um, and the sabotage is coming from within. The worrying factor should be ESCOM's power plants uh, is, is reaching the end of life, and that means ESCOM needs to, we're, we're now looking at about a 6,000 megawatt generation shortfall, but ESCOM needs to decommission about 22,000 megawatts before 2035, which has reached end of lifetime. And a uh, plan to replace this is nothing. There is, there is no generation capacity planned um, whatsoever to actually uh, fill, uh, fill this gap with government suddenly waking up and realizing we might need to generate more power at some point. Um, if we see this is the decommissioned uh, from ESCOM's decomm coal-fired plants decommission against what we should be using. We should be at almost 300,000 gigawatt hours in 2030 according to the CSIR's projections. Now we're not going to get there by any stretch of the imagination. To replace this uh, almost 20,000 megawatts of decommissioned, uh, Mr. Director himself estimated, and for once Minister Gordon agreed with him, uh, we would need almost 70,000 megawatts of renewable energy in, within the next 12 years that needs to come online um, to, to stay where we are. That is, that is the situation that, that we're looking at. And we've been looking down this barrel. Uh, the government has known about this for more than 10 years and, and done very little, if anything. So... When I say very little or anything, I'm not, that's not an opinion. This is government's plan. This is the, 
integrated resource plan that was published in 2019. In 2019, when it was published, it worked on the assumption that we would have a 2,000 megawatt shortfall. It was immediately outdated. We had a 4,000 megawatt shortfall in 2019 already. And this is, um, this is the stuff of dreams. Uh, this was Minister Montage developed this. So you, what you can see is we will, for some weird reason, magically add uh, 2,600 megawatt of renewable energy every year uh, through the IPP bid windows. With one problem is none of the, uh, none of the ones, uh, the yellow numbers, it's a bit small now, but every single year should have been 1,600 uh, wind and 1,000 solar. Yet um, the best we did with wind is we, we managed 800 megawatts one year. Uh, so we've never actually gotten close to these targets, yet they stay. It also has, if you look at 2030, we've got 2,500 megawatts of hydropower coming in. Now, this is Minister Montage, who made a deal with the Congo, with the Grand Inga Dam Scheme, which should be generating, according to their government, 70,000 megawatt of power. Um, the one problem with the Grand Inga Dam Scheme giving us power is that construction has not started yet, and... Um, funding has been withdrawn as well so there's no money to start building it and no one is building it uh, yet in our plans this is a critical part of getting, getting south africa to energy stability it stays there and then uh, this works on the assumption that our coal fired fleet fleet our, our coal fired fleet runs at 75 percent energy availability factor which it hasn't done in more than five years so this is basically a minister uh, literally just going into a fever dream and stating that this is what's going to happen and this is where we'll have enough energy and we'll just just have enough energy because the next slide is then this is uh, what should be happening so this is our installed capacity and according to the IRP um, if everything goes perfectly according to plan our installed capacity will be 43 percent more by 2030 uh, according to the CSIR we will be requiring 40 percent more power there's one problem with this however is the IRP then assumes that South Africa basically becomes a hellscape with the sun shining 24 hours a day and the wind never, ever not blowing. So if you work with 40% capacity for wind, which is more realistically what you get, 40% out of the installed capacity as well as then 30% for solar, then suddenly if everything gets executed perfectly, if government's plans, everything gets executed absolutely perfectly, we're going to have 15% more power by 2030, whilst we require 40% more. So obviously we're, we're in deep trouble. And if you rely on government to fix it, um, this was their one wonderful plan. Uh, it's the RMI PPPP. This was government moving as fast as it can. It's the emergency power procurement system. Now, it's a very interesting uh, tender that Minister Matash put out in 2020, which says we need 2,000 megawatt of emergency power. You need to be technology agnostic. Uh, they obviously put their BE requirements as well as pro local procurement requirements on this, but then for some weird reason uh, gave certain Turkish ships a free pass on, on, on those re requirements. But the one requirement for the RMI PPPPP was um, you need to be connected to the grid and delivering power by June 2022. And the first project reached financial close in June 2022 <laughs> and they started construction on the first solar project. None of the power that was emergency procured here has been delivered to the grid whatsoever. Um, we're sitting with three Turkish ships uh, in, in our harbour that, that desperately wants to connect to the grid. But the contracts that they insist on is it's, it's an emergency power procurement situation, but they want to sign 20-year contracts with a full take or pay at roughly 4,000 random megawatt hour for ESCOM. So that means uh, I've never seen emergency procurement go for 20 years, but that is that is what they're insisting on. And now, unfortunately, I think the state of disaster will well, they'll try to use it to get these guys connected um, and then uh, milk the South African fiscus mm -hmm. to no end. Mm -hmm. So then, it's not all doom and gloom. This question is solutions. How, how, where is South Africa going? Where are we going? What is clear from our situation is one: the situation is untenable. We've been slowly sliding into a crisis for the last 16 years. The second thing that is clear as day for, for us at Solidarity at least is government is not part of the solution here. It is 100% part of the problem. And that means whatever solution you get will have to be without them. So we looked at international examples for how do you get out of a situation like this. And ironically enough, the only other country that, that came into a similar situation as us is the one true communist country left in the world, which is Vietnam. Vietnam also started in about 2007, 2008 getting massive amounts of rolling blackouts. 
Now, the difference between South Africa and Vietnam is Vietnam grew into their energy crisis. The economy simply grew too fast for the grid to keep up. We shrank into ours. Our generation capacity uh, declined to such an extent that we can't meet the demands anymore. Um, yet what Vietnam did, uh, to their credit, is uh, these are communists who actually chose pragmatism over ideology. And they immediately, 2007, 2008, they started getting severe blackouts. Their single, uh, single state-owned energy supplier, Energy Vietnam, um, had a monopoly at that point, so it's very similar to what we were doing. But they immediately uh, made it a wholesale market. In 2011, they started getting uh, large private role players on. But then the ace up their sleeves that they finally figured out when they didn't quite work is they announced a generous feed-in tariff in 2017 and then once again in 2019. Now, a feed-in tariff from their perspective is quite simple. Um, it's specifically aimed at rooftop solar. And what they would then do is they would uh, say, we will buy whatever power you can generate from your roof onto the grid for the next five years or the next 20 years at a very generous price, which makes it worth it for you to actually do the investment. Um, and th doing that, they succeeded... Uh, far beyond what we could uh, ever imagine. The one caveat would be um, you need to be online within a year. So the feed-in tariff was announced in 2017 and you had one year to get the panels on your roof and then you would qualify and your panels would basically pay for themselves. Ultimately, this, this succeeded uh, dramatically. Uh, like, uh, this is the stuff of dreams. South Africa can only dream of, of getting these problems. Is They added 4,500 megawatts of rooftop solar in one year. In, uh, in 2017. Then they reopened the program in 2019 with once again from December 2019 till December 2020 with the same caveat saying you need to be online and this one was specifically focused on residential rooftop solar. And then they added 9,296 megawatt, 100,000 rooftop solar projects of which 6,000 megawatt of generating capacity was added in one month in December just before it closed. Which means Vietnam is now suddenly the leader in the world in terms of renewable energy. Um, this has, to such an extent, solved the energy crisis that they're now sitting with the second problem, which is now they need to go and shut down these rooftop solar projects because the grid can't handle the amount of electricity that is being pumped into it, which is a problem that South Africa would, would love to have. If we can get to that technical situation, um, I think none of us would at any point complain. So where are we going then, the future? What should we do? Where are we going? The first is um, South Africa is going to go through, we're, we're in a rough patch now, and it's, it's going to become a bit rougher uh, regarding power for the next two, three years. The next three years, we're simply looking at triage generation, is we need to get power onto this grid however we can. ESCOM has, is not going to do it. In the most recent budget speech, uh, zero rand was allocated to new generation capacity. So the state is not going to spend a single rand on creating generating capacity, but we do not have enough power, which means the only sector that can do it is the private sector and the community sector together. So we need to start getting small-scale embedded generation online dramatically. After that, from 26 to 29, there are several uh, large-scale private commercial projects that are in the pipeline, but they take two to three years to actually finish construction and start delivering. And then from 2030 onwards, our main problem is going to be at the moment, South Africa is still in a, in a good situation, whereas um, we've shrank from what our grid can handle. Our grid can handle a lot more especially from Mpumalanga, um, uh, than, than what we're generating at the moment. But we're going to once again hit grid limits roughly 2030 if we don't start investing in the grid. So luckily ESCOM has now been tasked with simply investing in the grid and getting that going and unbundling it into three different entities should help for that. But uh, we're first, 2023 to 2026, we're going to look at small-scale embedded generation. Now this is the, the, uh, the almost the reason why we're pushing for feeding tariff and for rooftop solar so hard. So this is uh, the, the ideal solar irradiation if you're at the optimal angle uh, regarding the whole world. So South Africa literally has the best solar resources, bar only the Sahara Desert, um, in the world. Uh, if you look at the numbers there, Pretoria, has, uh, you, theoretically you should be able to generate about 2,250 kilowatt hour per square meter um, if, you, if you install proper solar panels. If uh, every single, now spread is 2,000, there's almost nowhere in South Africa we are below 2,000. Whereas a country who we know, just now saw, Vietnam, who did it with massive efficiency, the best city in Vietnam for this is Ho Chi Minh City, 
which is at about 1,800 kilowatt hours per square meter. Uh, Berlin, Germany has actually uh, also a generous feed-in tariff scheme, and they've got massive amounts of rooftop solar that came in. But Berlin is a, is a very bad solar uh, situation with only 1,200 kilowatt hours per square meter. And then Edinburgh and Scotland, is, it's... <laughs> It's a it's a participation trophy, in that case. <laughs> it's a thousand kilowatt hours. So, that means what we're blessed with in South Africa is we've got the the best solar resources in the world, and we should be heavily investing in that direction. Yet we're insisting on investing on second grade coal and ke continuing in that that uh, that direction. So for triage generation, the only thing that makes sense that we can get online within a year and that will in South Africa really perform well above what it can do in other world uh, areas is getting solar on roofs as quickly as possible. That's why we're really pushing to say every single mall, every school, every university, every single space in South Africa should be getting these rooftop solars. Now, we had the tax incentive in the budget. It's a good start. It's, it's however, the absolute bare minimum that government can do. What should be happening is we should be implementing a feed-in tariff scheme with, let's make it a five-year horizon, getting people online within five years saying we're going to basically pay for your solar panel installation if you can get that energy onto the grid. Yet, um, our regulator, NERSA, has, I think the last time they actually published a feed-in tariff scheme was in 2011 when they revised it downwards with 40%. So they have decided this is not the way they're going to go. They've cancelled it in lieu of IPP bid windows with auctions, with an auction system where you apply for a certain amount of megawatts. But uh, this situation has, has not at all worked for South Africa. The IPPs are not coming online at the level that they should. Um, and we need decentralized power generation at a massive scale. And the way to do that is with uh, an incentive like this. The second problem that we're experiencing is not only from NERSA, as there have been no guidelines forthcoming whatsoever, but municipalities have been very, very sluggish to actually get themselves out of this crisis. And the, the amount of uh, all over the place regulations, uh, just to give you an idea, if you're going to Gauteng itself, uh, Ekuruleni would offer you a credit back, if you can feed back in, of 118, kilowatt, uh, 118 a kilowatt hour on peak time. So that means if you've got a solar system, you can lower your own bill by 118 a kilowatt hour if you feed back. Tuane, or Pretoria, um, for, we spoke to them, they offer you 12 cent a kilowatt hour. And when we asked them, why are you offering 12 cent? They said, no, we don't have a power shortage. And it was a bit hard to swallow when that happened last year. So um, this is in stage four load shedding at that moment. They say, well, this is, this is what they've got. And then you've got Mughala City, Krugersdorp, which has the most generous one of them all, which is 3 rand 62 kilowatt hour, but it's once again only, uh, you're only lowering your own bill. So that does not incentivize people actually generating. That means a lot of, if you get a solar system in Krugersdorp, you're going to have a, a power uh, uh, electricity statement of almost zero rand. It's not going to be uh, that bad for you. But there's no incentive to actually continue after you reach zero. You can't go negative as well. So this is a credit back. You can only lower your own account. Um, and then several uh, municipalities either have none or we can't find. City Power is one where there's, there's no, no info available. Do they actually give you credit back for, for getting yourself off the grid? The second problem is... Um, we need to use the existing electricity infrastructure on transmission grid is still quite healthy and quite, and it works quite well um, but to do that you need to wheel electricity across the grid so wheeling is is quite simply you would put one electron on at this point of the grid and then a customer would take another electron off at this point and then you would pay for the, the uh, a theoretical tariff for the cost of getting the electron there but it's obviously not the same electron because it, uh, it doesn't quite work that way um, ESCOM at the moment, however, uh, is the whole incentive scheme regarding wheeling is actively put there to get people off the network. Meaning the charge for peak time wheeling is 5 rand and 26, uh, 5 rand 26 per kilowatt hour, which is almost double what you would pay for consuming that kilowatt hour. So there's no way that any, con any supplier will actually put uh, a wheeling arrangement in place and sell to you during peak hours because it's going to cost them double what they're going to bill you uh, just to get the power there. Now, all of this lies with uh, one department and one minister who is at the moment uh, solely responsible for keeping us in load shedding, and that is Minister Montage, with the DMRE and NERSA actively avoiding uh, getting these incentives in place to get us out of this crisis. It's not even that difficult. We can subsidize wheeling at the moment just to get power onto the grid, and you'll make it back in tax money due to uh, businesses staying open 
within a year. Now they, they know this, the modeling itself in the IRP showed that the cheapest way to get electricity everywhere would be to just decentralize and privatize the grid. Um, yet the ANC chose to then only model it until 2030 because that's when the discrepancy starts being more than 10% and um, then publish it and say we're going only until 2030 and with a 10% discrepancy we can still do state-owned. When we're going to the private commercial space, and this is the part that, that does, however, it's the more positive aspect, is there are a lot of very dark clouds, literally, in Johannesburg today, but as well regarding electricity and the economy in South Africa. But we should not be so focused on the dark clouds that we miss the green shoots happening. The fact of the matter is Minister Mantash basically uh, let the horse go. The horse has bolted in 2018 at the mining in Daba when he told mines, you can come to South Africa, do not worry about power, build your own power station, we will uh, get the regulations uh, changed to accommodate this. And the impact of that was that business just basically started building private generation and they stopped caring. Now the ANC government has desperately tried to rein this horse back in and to try and get it once again uh, to feed at the trow and to, to be able to, to milk it if you, if, you, if you can stretch the metaphor that far. Um, but what we've seen now is uh, this is the... We, we recently uh, submitted a PIA application to NERSA to say we want to see how long does it take to register a business, uh, uh, register a, a, power a power entity, how many have you registered, and then we got the information back which says uh, this has been, as you can see, we registered almost no generating uh, capacity in the whole of 2021. At the end, it started picking up after the one announcement. Then in 2022, it drastically started picking up in August after President Ramaphosa's speech before the regulations to such an extent that uh, NERSA registered 1,600 megawatt of generating capacity in 2022. But in January 2023, they've already registered 1,000 megawatts. And it looks like it's continuing and increasing. So from our perspective, generation is not where the problem lies anymore. Generation, the private sector has, has really gotten involved. They've got, sunk their teeth in. And we've got several large-scale generating projects that are coming online, that are being registered. Our issue is getting these guys on the grid. The last thing um, for 2030+, plus, that's the wholesale market. Uh, that literally happened this afternoon. His cabinet approved a bill, which I'm not sure they read. Um, <laughs> But this bill breaks down the monopoly of ESCOM and basically creates a, it's meant to create a wholesale market in electricity where we'll finally have a situation where you don't have NERSA determining tariffs, but you've got the market that sends signals and you've got people who can uh, buy this good, which, it, which it's just a good to somebody producing, which can buy this good at the price that they deem necessary. As with any other, uh, if you've got fiber internet, cell phone, tel every, any other good like this, this is coming. So. There is positive news. It is, it is opening up in spite of government for the simple reason electricity is such a critical part. You can't uh, keep, keep a good man down in this situation. The three key issues that we're currently uh, addressing constantly, um, because we obviously need to focus. The first is, uh, why are we in a state of disaster? So we're busy with a court case against the state of disaster for the simple reason it's completely unnecessary. Uh, all the legislative instruments to handle this crisis has been in government's hands for more than 15 years. They've just simply not used them. And the state of disaster was a bit of political theater to say, but now we're really going to do something. Um, but what you're doing is you're giving unfettered power to people who have not succeeded in solving the problem. And from our perspective, that's like somebody driving down the street and hitting every single car on their way to the house. And they pull in, they go, oh, I should get a Boeing. And then... <laughs> and then get in a plane. So that, that just doesn't make any sense. That's why we're fighting it. And what you would see is that every single piece of legislation or announcement that they've made does not refer to the state of disaster at all. So we're in this weird situation. We're in a state of disaster with government having the capability to create any regulation to solve the crisis, but everything they do, they just refer to the previous legislative instruments. So it's, it's a bit of a situation where we're in, in it's theater mostly and completely unnecessary with massive risks, uh, as we saw with COVID, when you give COVID, government that type of power. The second question would be, how close are we to a total blackout? Is not is it on its way? Um, and, and the answer is, we are no closer than we were 10 years ago, and we're no closer than we were 20 years ago. A blackout, if you go through a historical list of blackouts, blackouts happen due to transmission failure 99% of the time. It's almost never due to generation failure. And uh, we've got several members at National Control who can tell you we're just as likely to hit a blackout at stage zero as we are at stage eight, as we are at stage 16. 
Uh, blackouts usually happen due to a natural disaster uh, that, that trips a high voltage line. In the 1965 legendary blackout in the northeast of America, a tree fell on a high voltage line and that had a cascading effect that put the whole grid out of service. But in South Africa, stage eight uh, doesn't mean we're closer to a blackout. In fact, it means we are further from it away because that is managing the load on the grid. We can theoretically go to stage 34 before a generation blackout would happen at stage 35 when we've got no power left on the grid whatsoever. So if a blackout happens, it will be due to a transmission failure. And um, there are several fail-safe mechanisms in, on this transmission grid that will kick in before that. Um, the one that we can mention is you've got a spontaneous low-frequency load shedding, which means they literally just drop whole provinces off the grid before uh, we go to a blackout, and that happens automatically once the frequency drops below 48 hertz. They, you just drop a whole province, you drop a whole metro to maintain the stability of the grid. The second is that every single, well, not every single, but several power stations in Africa um, will automatically island themselves. So when the grid's frequency drops below a certain level, uh, that power station disconnects from the grid and it keeps its own frequency up and it keeps on running, which means the restart isn't six days in that point. It's going to be a couple of hours if we're, if we're hitting that situation. But once again, w as long as we're in load shedding, the risk of a blackout is, is really uh, extremely low. Um, it's, it's the same. What would, however, cause a blackout is if we've got a tree falling on a high voltage line, if we've got a freak blizzard that freezes a, a pylon, or unfortunately, if somebody goes and blows up a pylon uh, with one of these high voltage lines. So sabotage can also uh, cause that. And in fact, from our perspective, the only way we're going to hit a blackout is if we've got several deliberate failures um, being done. I wish we could say that it, that is completely impossible in South Africa, but, uh, but we've seen too much subterfuge in, in power stations to say that it's a, a negligible risk, but it's not something that should happen in normal operating capacity. And then the last question is, but we've now heard that the grid is at capacity. Uh, wh where are we going to add new energy? And the answer is, it, it is true, the grid is actually at capacity f for dispatching energy from the Northern Cape and to the rest of the country, because South Africa, our grid was designed uh, with coal in mind, not with the sun in mind. And that means we've got a massive amount of high voltage lines from Mpumalanga to the rest of the country where, this, where the coal is situated. We do not have a lot of power uh, high voltage lines from the Northern Cape and parts of the Western Cape back into the country where the sun uh, is at, the, at its best. So you've got ESCOM that is desperately uh, giving land lease agreements to people in Mpumalanga saying, please put up a solar farm here. You've already got a grid connection, which is uh, extremely high voltage and you can immediately transmit um, most of that power and sell it uh, without waiting 18 months plus for a high voltage slot like in the Northern Cape. So we are in capacity generating wise from the Northern Cape, but Mpumalanga still has a lot of space. And uh, the projections that we've seen is your solar farm will be roughly 3% less efficient if you put it in Mpumalanga rather than, um, than the rest of the country. Uh, but once again, this is a strong argument for rooftop solar, which is by itself uh, much more decentralized and dispersed. Lastly, the future vision, where are we going? Um, as South Africa, what it, what it look like. The first is, unfortunately, I think we need to make, make peace with the fact that the, we will never again have a stable national network. It, it's just not gonna happen. Um, so we're way past the point where this can be centrally controlled anymore. The second would be that municipalities are going to be the masters of their own fate. Um, a municipality has, owns all the infrastructure within a municipal reticulation area where it sells uh, electricity or re resells electricity and it can already according to the municipal bylaws or municipal laws, add energy from any service provider. Um, thus far, it's just been impossible because there's only been one that's actually licensed to sell, um, but that is rapidly changing. So municipalities who put out tenders for energy will have it if they're willing to pay for it. And the benefits of actually um, being a municipality with electricity is going to far outweigh uh, com staying, with, uh, staying the course. The second would be um, ESCOM is most likely going to get a lot smaller. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, they're almost all our capacity. But within the next 10 years, ESCOM is going to be down to roughly 12 to 16 gigawatt of generating capacity with the private sector providing the rest. And then we're going to, if government wants it or not, we're going to have a wholesale market for electricity. The question will be if it's legal or not. Um, but that is the only thing that's, that's left is people will buy electricity. And then finally, uh, in 10, 15 years' time, South Africa is the ideal testing area for small-scale modular nuclear reactors, which we've already seen massive interest 
everyone wants to come test their small-scale modular nuclear reactor in a, situ in a country where you've got a massive demand for energy. And this is a solution that, that really fits our decentralized network where we're going like a glove. What is Solidarity doing specifically? Um, this is, we're in this fight, but it's a bit tricky. So just to, to uh, make us look a bit better, um, the first thing is we're really focusing on NERSA, um, saying they need to provide guidelines for feeding tariffs, for wheeling tariffs, and they need to, a registration for a, a private power generation should literally be a website where you're just saying, I'm generating this. There's no reason for them to ever, because they can't reject you, but they can constantly ask for more information. Uh, this doesn't make any sense. You can't connect to the grid without technical uh, guys from ESCOM helping you in any case, so there's not a real risk if they don't know. The second is um, we're putting a lot of pressure on municipalities. We've hit way too many uh, little emperors, is what, what we call them. You've got one official somewhere who's in charge of electricity in this municipality, and uh, they will ensure that every single bylaw is adhered to, even if the bylaw comes out of 1960, quite literally, which states a grid tight system cannot be online when the grid is down, which was meant when the grid wasn't down unless something horrible happened. But now at the moment you've got these people showing up at shopping malls saying, well, your solar system needs to be shut down, and even if you've got power during load shedding, you can't use it. And then uh, the specific focus here should be on opposition-run municipalities, which is why the Western Cape is on there. If one province or has, has the chance to be the first to go energy independent, it would be the Western Cape, which does not have to deal with the amount of political red tape that we need to deal with here in the north to get through it. The third is that we're getting involved in the energy space, but uh, not as a serious energy generating company. Um, we're not going to be solar darite very quickly. Um, but we're doing this more symbolically for the simple reason. Uh, we want to bulldoze through all of these uh, regulations and, and go through the process and make sure that we get everything in line so that the private sector can follow. Private sector companies are usually skittish for actually litigating against government because those same officials would then deny your licenses later. Um, we tend to not be that skittish when legislating against government, and they, they know that. They've called us litigious and abrasive at several times, which we take as a, as a mark of honor. Then fourthly, we're, uh, we're busy getting the state of disaster overturned. The court, uh, the court date should be somewhere in April, uh, making sure that we force government to either use the energy, uh, the legislative instrument they have, or to relinquish that control to communities as far as they can. The main reason would be we're not going to give President Ramaphosa the instrument to go around Minister Mantash. He needs to fire him and he needs to get rid of him as quickly as possible. And then the fifth uh, thing that we're doing, we're actively, uh, well, we're in advanced stages of getting for our own employees a finance model that we think other employers can, uh, can then copy, which enables employees to put rooftop solar on because the main problem people are sitting with is it's just too much of a capital expense at, at one time. But it's, it's a very low risk uh, 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 debt, if you, if you look at it that way. Uh, because this is somebody who's going to be saving on electricity and who, who wants this, um, in fact. So we're looking at a way for employers to make it an employee benefit, uh, starting with ourselves. And then we can't do the whole country, but if we can get our 500 employees off the grid um, somehow, then that should, uh, that should help a lot. All right, that is, that is it for now. Uh, I think we can do the Q and A, David. If you're if you're happy, I'll. Uh, yes. Well, yes. thank you very much, Connie. So we've got. Uh, yeah. Please. Uh, okay. All right. So I think this is a good opportunity for for Q and A, and I see uh, a hand over there from this gentleman. Who is responsible for the design faults and for the sabotages? Do you know that? <laughs> um, now I need to tiptoe past libel. So um, <laughs> the design faults is uh, Itachi Power Africa uh, through, and they got the tender through Chancellor House, and there's actually been in America found to be a corrupt tender, uh, but in South Africa, for some weird reason, we have not acted on that at all. But the other thing is that um, when government was warned in 1998 that they need to design a power station and we need to build new ones, they simply ignored this, mm -hmm. and then they hastily rushed it through within a year or two with designs that do not make a lot of sense, that do not work, um, and that constantly break. And that is where we are. Regarding the sabotage, um, we haven't, we've, we've get, had several arrests, but what is curious is that the sabotage seems to be coordinated. Um, 
if you've got sabotage on one side, that you can uh, just say it's, it's somebody acting on their own. But when three or four sites get sabotaged at the exact same time uh, in different geographical areas in the country, uh, that would indicate that somewhere somebody is giving a command for this to be sabotaged. Um, and that usually falls uh, when, when the pressure would, would be the worst. So I don't think it's any, uh, any coincidence that after Mr. Director is gone, it, it suddenly uh, got a lot better. Ah, um, no, they they go quite high up uh, with, we can't state names because then I'm going to spend the night in prison. But what I can state is that nowhere in the world does organized crime operate at this level without extensive government involvement and protection. And that is exactly what we're seeing here with government officials at the very highest levels uh, being intricately involved in defrauding ESCOM as well as then actively sabotaging to get rid of Mr. De Reiter and Mr. Uberolzer, who has stopped billions of rands of uh, fraudulent tenders. Uh, but the other part is to plain simply uh, get bogus repair contracts uh, with bogus hours that they're then reselling to ESCOM. Mm -hmm. In some of these sites, the same part has been sold to ESCOM more than 200 times. So the modus operandi, I don't know if you've read about Daddy Maverick, but we've, we've now heard from our members way more extensively the way it works. Um, you would... Uh, start a shell company, or well, start six shell companies uh, with the same director of, uh, well, uh, who, who would own all six, and they would all six get on ESCOM's list of preferred suppliers. Then a piece of machinery would suddenly break or be re go missing. But go missing it means they, they literally throw a top over it, and it's gone. And your inventory controller says, well, we need a new one. So they would order it, and then six companies on the preferred supplier list, which all have the same director, would tender within 5% of one another, but almost 40 to 50% more expensive than should be. Uh, one of these six with the same director would get the tender. Uh, the truck would show up empty at the gate. A security guard who gets paid something would sign off that the truck arrived. The inventory controller would sign off that the truck arrived and was offloaded, and then they would take the top off the piece of machinery and would say, ah, here it is. So they've literally, some of these things, I know one of our members told us, this thing has been sold more than 200 times. And the problem with that is the paper trail is fine. You can't get them on the paper trail at all. But these companies are writing between 20 and 30 million rand worth of uh, procurement orders per power station. Um, so we're looking at upwards of a billion rand that is just being siphoned every month um, from ESCOM. That's how you've got situations of people the one guy was stealing more than a hundred million rand worth of oil from an ESCOM power station every month. And then he got arrested um, after Mr. Director let the right policeman know. And the next day he was released on 500 rand bail. And uh, we, he's been gone after that. We, we don't know where he, where he went. But that means no organized crime facility can operate at this level without one extensive government involvement. We know exactly who the people are, and we, we know them quite well. Uh, several of them we've, we've hit in negotiations. There are trade union officials, there are INC elected officials. Um, but the other part is government protection, which means you've got several police officers, unfortunately, especially in Pumalanga, who are also in on this. And then we get, on the other hand, we've got members in the SAPS who would suddenly phone us with that they had the weirdest phone call from a general. Uh, they, they pulled it truck over which was carrying nothing and it was uh, suspicious and then they got told to just leave it immediately and uh, and they did that so we're looking at unfortunately an, an extensive integrated uh, situation all right so if i could ask when you ask your question if you could just introduce yourself uh, you said i think you had your hand up hi uh, rod harper the the what's your understanding of matashi <coughs> Um, I, I've litigated against him when, when he was the secretary of the trade union, and he came across as a hardline Marxist, full of rhetoric and, and, and nonsense. Mm. The, is this his self-interest, or is it ideological? Is it something else, or a combination of things? Um, so we actually have quite good relations with Minister Mantashi because of the trade union history, but they have soured recently. Um, is is a unique example in that I think he's a true Marxist to the core, meaning he believed in the ideology until he started drinking champagne, and now suddenly uh, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. And uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, Minister Montage, from what we can tell, 
has quite extensive vested interests in the coal mining industry as well as transporting coal. Um, not necessarily him himself, but several of his close associates would be benefiting from that. So that's why he's got this hard line to maintain coal constantly with uh, truly yeah, truly stupid statements like uh, we've got 40,000 megawatt and we need 34,000, just run the plants better, as if that's not what they're trying to do. Um, we did what he suggested for 2016 and 2017 under Machela Coco, which ran the plants into the ground, and now we're sitting with the problem no maintenance was done because then you can get to 34,000 megawatts, but you can get to that for one year or two years, and then you're going to sit with a 20,000 megawatt deficit. So that's why it's, it's a weird situation, especially what, what we find puzzling, is his really rabid resistance against the just energy transition um, to try and move away from coal to renewables when there are several international agreements in place that South Africa has signed and that we need to comply with uh, to actually get our carbon emissions down. Along with that, there's massive amounts of funding that will come this way. We're talking about billions of euros and dollars if we, if we go in the just energy transition um, direction. So from a country perspective, it just makes sense to to try and get it going as much as possible. Um, and then you've got a minister who's, who's constantly pushing a, a decrepit coal fleet, which, which just can't do it anymore. Um, so I think it's a mixture of one, self-interest, and the second would be the ideology does not allow any actors outside the state to, to do anything. Um, and that means he just can't see a power situation without one single state utility providing all the power when in the rest of the world, uh, we, we would be seen as very, very uh, old in terms of the way that we're approaching this. Most other countries have either privatized generation or even transmission. There's still an, an argument to be made saying, no, we can't privatize transmission because there's a state security at risk if, if a private company runs the transmission grid. But you can't say the same with generation. Um, and that's why it's this uh, fertile, uh, uh, yeah, fertile ground for corruption, when you've got somebody who insists on one single actor um, who's got lots of self-interest in maintaining the status quo as it is, but at the same time then using Marxist ideology and literally quoting Marx in several policy documents to get the rest of the ANC, which is more on the, on the state uh, side, on the socialist side, in line with, oh, this makes sense because it fits into our ideology. So it's a weird... It's a weird situation. From our perspective, he is the number one reason we're still in, in load shedding. Um, as Minister of DMRE, he can, let, okay, he can announce the day after tomorrow. He can announce that we need 8,000 megawatt of emergency procurement and we don't care how we get on the grid uh, and you need to be online within a year. The reason I say the day after tomorrow is according to law, he has to consult with NERSA and they need to determine that there is in fact an energy shortage. Uh, that should be one of the shortest meetings in the country. Uh, is if you just go in and then pff, the lights go off at uh, at some point, and then he can gazette it. He can do it tomorrow. Well, the day after tomorrow, he can gazette. We need 8,000 megawatt. We need 6,000 megawatt. He can even in that gazette state who should be buying this. So he can he can conf uh, commit treasury to saying, all right, municipalities would be buying this, or Eskom will be buying all the power and redistributing it. He can do all of this, and he. But the problem is he is able to do this for the last 10 years. We could have solved it with uh, private procurement 10 years ago if you wanted to and the only reason that we can find is um, there's a constant sluggishness they would do what the, after you compel them with a the court case they will do what they have to do but they will do it in the maximum amount of time and they would to do it in the bare minimum that they want to or that, that they need to which is something that that we find sort of puzzling given the situation but if you want an example President Ramaphosa announced last year I think August that we're going to uh, remove the cap uh, they had 30 days to then amend the regulations. Now, it's not a difficult amendment. It's literally removing one number, and they took 31 days to do it. So it's, it's just this constant sabotage, and that's why we don't have a lot of hope for Minister Ramakhopa, the new Minister of Electricity, for the simple reason that the problem children are still there. And if you think you're going to work around Mantash with a new ministry, there's no way he's going to stand in your way and actively block any any movement towards decentralized renewable power generation because that's what he's done the last five to ten years. Can, sorry, can I do a follow-up? It's, it's okay. Sure. Comes to Syria, sorry. and then we'll uh, mm. come back. Terry Markman. Connie, uh, just apropos of the grid, 
and, and, and the government not wanting to sell it because of uh, not, not control. Hmm. You could do what Maggie Thatcher did. She sold a lot of her stuff, but she held what was called one golden share. Hmm. And it could be 1% or, 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 or a, just, a, just a golden share. And that, and that has a controlling uh, power over certain situations. So you can't sell the grid overseas or whatever it is. If it's for British Airways, you couldn't sell it, you know. Yeah. So that, that's one way of getting out. Um, this new deregulation bill, I didn't know about it, it seems very good news, but does it allow somebody, anybody, to, to um, generate power but sell it off-grid? To me, to me, the single most important thing is to deregulate in such a way that says that Mr. A, could be a farmer, he could be a, uh, somebody in a, in, a, in a CBD area, a mine near a town, can generate as much as he wants and sell it to whoever he wants and it go off grid. And the reason why I say that is a couple of reasons. One is because the, off, because the grid's got a uh, problem with capacity. But my understanding, and I mean, I was more involved in this five or six years ago, that is going to can it continuously be a barrier to opening up that grid. I mean, I used to joke, I used to say, to, 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 we were dealing with some of the mines, and the mines would, would, want, to, would want to connect to the grid. And Eskimo would say, yes, come along, but I'm just busy now. Can we get in, get in, get in, come and have coffee, but not now in six months' time. And you're phoning six months' time in the same sort. Yeah. So they would kick it into touch somehow or other. So it seems to me an important equation part of the thing is, is to get it off grid. Off grid. Yes. Now, I don't know what would happen. Nobody knows. But it means that mm. I can sell to my neighbor, but I don't know if that's legal at the moment. That doesn't matter. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. So... It won't do something exactly. illegally. Okay. So the regulations already, actually, if you're not uh, connected with a distribution or transmission network, um, then there's very little governing what you can do with that power. And that we, we're busy, we're going to skirt that line with uh, Saltec and Saltec's residences where they're not going to be connected to the grid, but they are most definitely going to be connected to one another. Um, and, and the question is, they will be transmitting power, and we'll see who, who comes along and tries and stop that. Um, so... If you're totally off-grid, if you're not connected to the distribution network, um, in, the, in the past the mines would have struggled because you needed a license above a certain megawatts. Yeah. But with the registration, uh, you can generate a thousand megawatts. And if it's not touching the distribution system, um, then, then NERSA can register you. But there's no control after that. And where that thousand megawatts goes, if you want to uh, put it across uh, title, uh, if you want to put it across boundaries, uh, that, is, that is possible unless you start, and that is the one court case that we're now uh, Afri Forum is going to be in court, I think it's next week, is uh, Frankfurt, uh, it's the rural free state court case, where you've got six farmers, well, it, it's two court cases, so let me, let me elaborate a bit. The one court case is uh, Frankfurt, the rural town in the free state, fascinatingly enough, is an example for where we should be going, is that municipality went, uh, almost 10 years ago, went, we can't manage the electricity, yeah, and they got a private contractor in to run their transmission, their distribution, to do uh, debt uh, collection. And suddenly what happened is Frankfurt uh, is paying its electricity on time and everyone has power. But it's, it's been such a success that they're sitting with more than enough power to not have load shedding. Yet, due to the grid operator code, they need to shut the, the town down when load shedding happens. So they're, they're not pulling from the grid, but they need to still put the people in the dark. Um, and now uh, this is something that screams for litigation that says why uh, this doesn't make any sense uh, they've got enough power they're not drawing from the rest of the grid they're not causing grid collapse or anything uh, regarding that and um, they're not going to endanger the grid uh, this mafube is the municipality they should be able to get themselves through load shedding they've got enough capacity to do it and it's a private uh, company that actually runs the distribution on behalf of the municipality so that's a model that we would very much like to roll out in the in the rest of the country saying but get a private uh, company in to run it and um, that's the one. The second part is um, ex exactly this issue with ESCOM is whilst you've got ESCOM's top brass that are, that well, uh, we'll see with the new guy, but with Mr. Director, who blatantly said ESCOM will not be able to provide it in the, in the energy capabilities. We need the private sector to get online. I will uh, give you this much hectares next to power stations. Please come build power plants and generate electricity. Um, you've then got in the free state it's, uh, six farmers who set up a solar uh, farm for for themselves, for their farms to power uh, their farms. And then they told ESCOM, okay, but we would like to wheel the electricity across your network from our solar farm to our farms, uh, just to make sure it gets there. And then ESCOM said, no, we're not going to allow you onto the network. So they went, all right, we're going to mark a plan. We're then going to build our own network 
to get uh, this. And then ESCOM said, no, we're not going to allow you to do that either, which is so out of lockstep with what everyone else is saying. So that's going to court as well in the next uh, month or so saying, but you can't, you, you can't, cannot not solve the problem and then prevent everyone else from solving the problem as well. And if these two cases go the way that we, we think they go, that's going to create a massive precedent for, you can imagine, every single estate in this country will suddenly be able to say, oh, we're going to build a, a concentrated solar plant off-site, and then we're going to wheel back to our own entity that buys it and then resells it according to the license or the distribution license that we already have. So we're not even moving out of the regulations as such. We just want to wheel it one or two kilometers, and that's, that's what we need. And if we can get that going, uh, that will ultimately lead to a situation where you've got people who are now going to do the trade-off. Is do I create the solar plant or the wind turbine um, in the east of Pretoria with only 50 kilometers of wheeling, which has a certain loss factor, or do I go into the Northern Cape where there's a lot more sun, but I lose more across? And that's just, that's the normal market forces that you want at work. Exactly. And that, that is something that you can't do centrally. You want entrepreneurs to be busy saying, I'm going to take the opportunity and create a solar farm here, or I'm going to, uh, what, what is something that we, we can already see companies doing that. I'm just going to rent people's roof space so I'm going to say I will pay you for your roof space and I'm going to put my panels on your roof and then I will pay you in kilowatt hours and the rest I'll take for myself and resell to the universe or to the municipality or to whomever I want so what we can see is government is barely holding on to the energy market desperately trying to control it but um, the amount of illegal installations that have just gone ahead is actually staggering is you've got whole shopping centers that are completely illegally or uh, with solar panels or generators that should have been registered that they need to shut down which they're just not doing and the frankfurt guys and they they just don't switch off the power during load shedding anymore and the question is who's going to is come going to show up and tell them no you need to switch off the power that you're generating yourself um, that's it's not something that's possible in south africa at the moment and that is we're trying to get those examples out into the world and saying but this is the way you should be going um, get a community, start generating your own power, and then just create the reality. Ultimately, what we've seen, especially with something as critical as energy, is the re legislation will uh, adapt to the reality. It's going to, we are going to get to energy stability with or without government. Is, does, is this kind of the organization that can stop these farms, or is it, was it NERSA or the... Or the it's, in this case, they need to go across ESCOM's uh, distribution license area. That's the problem. So it's actually ESCOM. The other one is the Mafuba municipality, which has a license, but it's once again the municipality itself saying, well, it, it's NERSA then saying, no, but you need to switch switch it off if, if it's if it's shedding. So it's, it's this weird, unholy alliance of people who are trying to get all regulation to keep us in the dark. And uh, there are some light points, and there will be a lot more. There's a question at the back. Um, Tony Hampson, Tyndale. You mentioned the problem of uh, unemployment. That's never going to change because our reproduction rate is too high. Secondly, the labor legislation we have at the moment indicates that you have to be certifiably insane to employ one more person. Um, if the legislation was changed to allow the employer the same rights as the employee to terminate the relationship, um, that would make a huge difference and it would create a far more responsible labor force and radically increase our productivity. And then also there needs to be an overhaul of the CCMA because going to the CCMA is a certainty. You can guarantee as an employer you're going to lose, particularly if you happen to be a white male. Um, the second point I'd like to make is in relation to the writing off of the cost of installations. At the moment, it only relates to the solar panels. If the legislation was changed to allow companies to write off the entirety of the cost of the installation, and the solar panel is only a very small part of the cost, the large part is the batteries. And not only is it a large part, but these batteries don't last for more than a few years, and you have to replace them, so it's very, very expensive. But if the fiscus would allow the writing off in the year of acquisition against taxable income, the tax revenue, I suspect, would increase simply because companies would be profitable. And they're not profitable at the moment across, this, across the board simply because of the gross mismanagement of, of COVID. And secondly, um, and secondly the, the mismanagement of the electricity supply situation. Yes, so on the, on the first, as a trade union, we, we've had better success at the CCMA, but, uh, but I suspect <laughs> that might prove your point. Uh, no, uh, regarding South Africa's labour situation, the, yes, there are very, several factors that contribute to unemployment. Uh, we're one of the few trade unions that vehemently 
argued against the minimum wage, for example, saying this just doesn't make any sense. Uh, quoting Leon Lowe, previous director at for the Foundation, saying the true minimum wage is zero. And that is what you're creating, is you're creating a desperate amount of uh, young, unemployed, uh, most of the time black people, who cannot get into the labor market because you're making it too difficult. Uh, they need to start working for, at this moment, it's almost 5,000 rand a month, when, uh, quite frankly, they, they just do not have the skills to get that going. But you can't get them the skills because they don't have the income to get the skills. So you're just dooming them to a lifetime of poverty without being able to get out of it. And that explains the really brutal xenophobia because uh, then foreigners come in and they're not, uh, they don't have to adhere to these regulations. And suddenly they get jobs and then they do what every normal person wants to do is they want to better themselves with what means they have at that point. And that's why... Uh, we think government is, is setting South Africa up to fail with its labor legislation, quite simply. Um, we can, we've, we've got a demographic dividend. That's the, the good part about a high reproductive rate is we've, we've got a massive working class population. And other countries have successfully employed these people and then you can uh, invest in long term, uh, if you want to, social welfare programs, but that ends badly. But in long term infrastructure that generates more economic growth, but you need to make sure that you actually harnessing the demographic dividend, and we're not doing that at the moment by having most of these people not in employment. Um, so there are several methods that we can do. What we do however see at the moment that has massively increased this is the fact that companies don't have energy stability. And if I need to pay diesel every month, I'm, I'm not going to employ more people. Um, even, if, even if it's necessary, I'm going to cut hours, and that is what we've, what we've seen work out. Um, the, the second question, wait, no, 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 the first one was the CCMA. Um, second one, can you maybe refresh right now? Basically, the facility to write off in the year of that position. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. So um, the, the tax incentive is, it's not nearly enough. But if, if you go five years back, it was unthinkable. So it's a baby step in the right direction from, from government's perspective. For individuals, it's only the panels. For businesses, it's 125% of the cost of installation that you can actually write off against taxable income. Which is with, and that's the important part that I think people miss is with no cap on the amount of megawatts, which theoretically means you can install a thousand megawatts system uh, and then write that off against taxable income. Now it doesn't; it's not a straight write-off. You're only going to reduce your tax. So I think on a million rand system, it's going to be about seventy to eighty thousand rand that you directly save as a business. Um, but it's still it's still something uh, regarding. Budgeting, I think it was four billion for the rooftop solar one, or for the residential one, and five billion for businesses is not nearly enough to get us out of the crisis. So we're, we're in the situation where you need to applaud government when they move in the right direction, even if it's not as far as you would like, um, because if you're only going to criticise them, even when they move in the right direction, then then we're going to get them going the, the direction that they want, which is the Marxist direction, saying we're going to scrap this in in its entirety. So I think our exact position is. It's a baby step in the right direction. We would like to see more, but at least we're moving towards decentralizing generation. And that is uh, what uh, the Minister Gwana explicitly stated in the budget statement as well. Is the reason they're only doing it for solar panels is because they want to increase generation capacity. They don't want to increase your backup system for, for load shedding, which means uh, somewhere in the back alleys, uh, they are aware of the fact that they will have to buy power from rooftop solar and they want to get enough panels in the country now to get the capacity going and that is what they're trying to incentivize is getting more generation capacity not necessarily getting more backup power to to survive a load shedding situation so cautiously optimistic but if if the nca government has done one thing they've never disappointed uh, to disappoint so it's most likely what is going to happen here as well um they've accidentally done the right thing a couple of times but never on purpose just a quick question. question. Right. We're in the same suburb as Tony. And uh, interesting enough, I do a lot of work with a farming community. And without a tax incentive, I used to be with Louis Lake many years ago. We've been supplying the farming community for 40 years with host clamps. And I've come across Uppington as well as Prisco. Big solar panels. We don't need tax incentives. These farmers fly in jumbo jets to bring their grapes from Uppington to Europe to the UK. There's no, we don't need tax incentives. My background is accounting and tax and foreign exchange. We don't need tax incentives. Just go ahead, do Uppington, do Presca, 
Now we're doing, you, you can do anything you want to. Like the Western Cape, we don't need tax incentives. We don't need government, we don't politicians. We just want to do private enterprise, nothing to do with anything to do with politicians. Ideally, yes. <laughs> Yes. Uh, but they will get more money because we make more profit. Off them. <laughs> it sounds like mm. that's a debate for uh, having had a glass of wine after this. Um, well, yeah, please, sure. last question. <laughs> um, first of all, the main question <coughs> is if you could explain something about the very first thing you said about <coughs> whether Paris State was, can go under business rescue and why that's an issue. And secondly, very shortly, you mm. said that Vietnam was the last communist country in the world. What's not communist about North Korea? Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> valid, valid. Yeah. It's, uh, I'll retract. <laughs> I'll state North Korea. Vietnam was one of the last. It, it, they recently turned to free market for power. Um, regarding parastatals and business rescue, it's a uh, Terry would. Uh, they, they went with us on that journey as um, we identified about four or five years back SAA as, a, as an ideal test case to see if we can place a state-owned enterprise under business rescue. What that would entail is that you would take over functioning of, uh, of the state-owned enterprise with a business rescue practitioner. At that point, we pushed quite hard for Klutemari, who was now assassinated, um, to be the business rescue practitioner for SAA. And what we found is, no, well, unfortunately, what we found was the Companies Act explicitly makes provision for state-owned companies to still be um, uh, vulnerable to being placed under business risk or even liquidation. And that means um, if ESCOM is not a going concern, theoretically, you could, as employees, which as a trade union, we then serve as a representative, so we've got local study, we could bring an application to place it under business rescue. But the, the question that we struggled with is, it's a bit difficult to state that this company is not a going concern when the shareholder has limitless funds. And that is what SAA hit is, they can just, the bailouts will never stop. So ultimately, we never really got the chance to, to prove it in court. We desperately wanted to, uh, but then uh, with, Minister, with SAA, with Minister of uh, Mr. Harana leaving, uh, we then applied, uh, lodged our application, and then the board of SAA put themselves under business rescue a day after our application. And then you had the weird situation where we were going to litigate to put a company under business rescue that's already under business rescue. And uh, our, our advocates' at, advice was that we're going to get a very angry judge that is going to tell you these two issues should be together, and um, we wanted the combative we're taking you to court to put you under business rescue and you're actually fighting us. But the moment the board decided they wanted to do it as well, uh, then unfortunately you, you couldn't put that in there. Already, that's, that's the thing. So what we did show, however, is that the end of that situation is that SAA is theoretically has been sold 51%, although that deal is going nowhere with Takatsu. That's, that's fallen apart. Um, but the hope is that you get the private, just the idea that you need the private sector more involved is something that was completely anathema to government at that point. And now you'll constantly hear them talking about how the private sector should do all of these things to such an extent that every single megawatt that we're going to generate in the next 12 to 15 years will come out of the private or community sector. The government admitting that, in, even if they're not doing it in speeches, they're most definitely <laughs> doing it in uh, statements, uh, literally financial statements. The balance sheet is a bit too strong to actually justify that. That's the, that's the one problem. Is, um, uh, ESCOM's balance sheet is a tricky situation because how do you value a power station if you're the only one who can use it? Um, you can put the value on there that you want. Uh, no one knows what it's worth. But we're going to see if they're actually going concern uh, within the next couple of years when you've got private power generation uh, that's coming online with big uh, private players. My suspicion is that uh, with this newest bailout, um, ESCOM is going to survive their cash flow crunch. Uh, and then, then it's going to be very tricky to say, but they're not a going concern. You're trading recklessly, and we, we can actually uh, put you under business rescue and, and get you out of it. On a practical level, um, I don't think there's a business rescue practitioner in this country that will take that case because your life expectancy will be very short. Um, Right, well, on that uh, sombre. Downbeat note, <laughs> <laughs> I would uh, just like to say thank you very much, Connie, uh, for you. 
sharing your insights with us. And uh, I have a, a small token of our appreciation, uh, which is a bottle of red wine to help Wonderful. ease the pain of uh, South Africa's uh, <laughs> preferably enjoyed in the dark, uh, but, <laughs> but uh, hopefully one day in the light. So, yeah, I just wanted to express uh, our gratitude as the Free Market Foundation for you coming through from Pretoria and speaking to our audience, uh, both in person and at home on, on YouTube live stream. Uh, so for those who are watching on the live stream, uh, I would encourage you to please, if you're in Gauteng, to join us in person next time. We have an ongoing schedule of monthly events. Uh, and to those who have joined us today, thank you very much. And please do join us uh, for a glass of wine after the talk. But I uh, can't help but uh, be impressed by the work that Solidarity does. It is, uh, I think, a real exemplar of uh, the potential uh, of, of individuals and communities coming together uh, sharing resources, know-how, mm. and and expertise, and and creating alternatives to the state, and also holding the state uh, to account uh, where necessary. So I think we need more organisations like Solidarity, uh, and I'm very encouraged uh, to see the the proliferation of civil society organisations that we have in this country. I think it's uh, the the greatest hope that we have for a more prosperous and free future. So. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope to see you here again. Thank you, David. Yeah. Yes. Thank you.